Okay, well, in that case, let's get started. Um, hi, everybody. I am Lisa Chamberlain. I'm a senior lecturer at Wits University, um, working on environmental justice issues. I'm just going to switch my camera on for two minutes at the beginning, and I'll switch off again now. And welcome to today's very exciting session uh, as part of the Environmental Law Association Conference on Environmental Constitutionalism. Um, which is obviously a very topical issue at the moment, uh, given that the UN Human Rights Council is sitting as we speak to consider the possibility of a UN resolution recognizing the right to a healthy environment, which is, I'm sure, something that will be picked up in the panel. I'll just introduce uh, our panel very briefly at, up front um, before we get before we get going, and also to say that I'm co-chairing today with uh, my colleague uh, Professor Oliver Fuhr from uh, Northwest University, who will be assisting. So we've got four amazing speakers lined up for you. First up will be uh, Professor James May, who is currently a visiting professor at the SJ Quinney College of Law at the University of Utah in the US. And he'll be giving us the case for environmental human rights recognition, implementation and outcomes. He'll be followed by Dr. Melanie Murcott, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Pretoria here in South Africa, and also, of course, the vice chair of the Environmental Law Association. And she'll be discussing the importance of transformative environmental constitutionalism in climate litigation. After her will be Pasquale Viola, who's joining us from Charles University in Prague in the Czech Republic. Lovely to have colleagues from other parts of the world, so welcome. Um, and that presentation will be on constitutionalisms and the environment from different viewpoints, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And then last, but certainly not least, will be Amy Wilson, who is a board member of the Animal Law Reform uh, uh, South Africa, and also a Brooks Institute uh, Animal Law and Policy Fellow at UCLA School of Law in the US. And she'll be discussing the right to environment, exploring interactions and opportunities for human and non-human animals. In terms of format, uh, we are going to ask each speaker to keep themselves strictly to 20 minutes. And apologies if I get a little draconian about that, just trying to stick us to time so that we've got good space for discussion afterwards. Um, and we'll be running the session with kind of one presentation, then we'll open up for a couple of questions on that presentation before we move to the next one um, and run it like that. And then if there's time, we'll have uh, open discussion at the end. So with no further ado, um, Jimmy, can I hand over to you? Sure, good morning, Lisa. I'm just trying to get this shared screen um, to work or to cooperate. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, and uh, I, I don't see the slides appearing, do you? <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> Not yet, no. Okay. You need to be made a co-host. All right, um, whatever whatever it takes uh, works for me. I don't think I have uh, hosting rights. Um, uh, Jimmy, you are supposed to be, you, you're able to do so. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there should yep. be a green um, button, something yeah, happening. I, yeah, I see that, but I don't see the slides. All right. Um, well, let me give it one more try here with we'll something else, and otherwise we'll just start. Um, yeah, Does anyone see. else have a copy of your presentation? I, I, I see. I think you just have to click on the green button. Yeah, I am. I, uh, yeah, I'm doing that. It just doesn't uh, give me the option uh, to do it. Um, to me, if you if you want, you could um, email the, your presentation to. Uh, to myself or to Oliver, and we can see if we can share it from our side. Well, that's okay. That's okay. I mean, we we can just start if that's okay. okay. You know, I know we're sure. tight on time. Um, Go ahead. So, am I am I on the screen? Is that all good? Audio and video, okay. Perfect. Okay, because uh, I just see your name on my screen, Lisa. So I don't know what's showing. <laughs> all right. Well, um, well. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good afternoon and good evening. So it's great to uh, to have you be a part of this. So I'll be talking about the case for environmental human rights. And as Lisa mentioned, you know, it's a hugely important issue because this week and for the next few weeks, 
uh, it's a matter that um, is and may be further considered by the UN Human Rights Council. I mean, it's really a, a moment to take stock in uh, environmental law and human rights uh, and in what human beings can do to address uh, cataclysm uh, on, a, uh, on a planetary scale. Uh, so with that cheery beginning, uh, uh, let's, I just want to talk to you about the case for environmental human rights with just uh, um, a few things. Um, so first is about, you know, uh, sort of the idea of where they come from. Uh, and by the way, I just published an article on the, uh, the case for a right to a healthy environment. I'm happy to share it. It's available on SSRN um, and all that good stuff. So you can read the details of what I'm talking about if, you, if you'd like. Uh, so the case for environmental human rights really begins with recognizing that it's nothing new. Uh, it actually goes back uh, to the Magna Carta. Uh, it has origins in other places too, uh, in religious and cultural doctrines. Uh, and it's, it's, it's this idea that, there's an, uh, that the linkage between the planet and people is inextricable, uh, that we can't divorce ourselves from nature. We can't divorce ourselves from environmental outcomes because it connects all of us. Uh, and that's an idea that was uh, struck at Runnymede in 1215 with the Magna Carta and then the, the corresponding um, forest charter. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Uh, so the next thing is where it begins, uh, this idea of legalizing a right to a healthy environment. And it begins in what seems like an unlikely place these days, which is the United States. In 1968, a, a, a congressman named Richard Ottinger uh, who is a congressman from the state of New York, uh, proposed that the U.S. Constitution be amended to incorporate a right to a healthy environment. It didn't happen, as you know, um, uh, but it did help uh, pave the way for a piece of legislation called the National Environmental Policy Act, which is close as the United States has ever come to recognizing um, a right uh, to a healthy environment. Uh, but the first place uh, the right to a healthy environment was legally rec recognized uh, was also in the United States, but at the subnational level. You see, the, in the US, uh, we're this odd republic where we have a federal government and then we have 50 states and then uh, other sovereigns within that system. And they all have their own constitutions. So uh, we can look to see if states have adopted a right to a healthy environment and some have. And the first place on the planet to constitutionalize a right to a healthy environment was the state of Illinois, which in 1970 uh, amended its constitution uh, with the following language. Each person has the right to a healthful environment. Sound familiar? Well, yeah, that's, that's the year the Beatles broke up um, from Illinois. And then in the ensuing few years, uh, several other states in the United States adopted a right to a healthy environment, including Pennsylvania in 1971, Massachusetts and Montana in 1972, and that's before Stockholm, and then Hawaii in 1978. So speaking of Stockholm, there's, you know, how, do, how does a right to a healthy environment uh, work its way into uh, international law? Well, early on, um, in 1972, beginning with the beginning, you know, we had the Stockholm uh, Declaration, and it was there where we first see international recognition of the right to a healthy environment with this language. So pardon me for reading it, but you don't have the, the slide, and you've probably heard it a million times, but it just, uh, it's, it's still good, it still sings, and it still warrants um, recognition. It reads that man um, has uh, the fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of a quality that permits a life of dignity and well being and bears a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. Uh, that's a tall order, isn't it? Uh, but it's from 1972. And in the ensuing decades, there hasn't been much further development on the international stage until fairly recently. There are some exceptions. In 1989, there was recognition of a right to, a, uh, to live in dignity and a, a viable global environment in the Hague Convention. 
the Rio Declaration makes a passing reference with humans are at, at, by recognizing that humans are at the center of concerns for sustainable development and they are entitled to a healthy and productive life. Uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, as we know, makes a perambulatory reference to human rights, but not to a right to a healthy environment. Uh, and, but there's this ongoing conversation, again, as Lisa mentioned at the beginning, uh, about whether there should be international recognition of a right to a healthy environment and what that means and, and um, so on. Um, so uh, there have been regional developments. You know, so this idea of a right to a healthy environment has its origins at the subnational level in the United States and then um, in, in, at the international stage in Stockholm, um, and then on the on regional stages throughout the globe in the last three decades, uh, including the San Salvador Protocol, the Charter on Human and People's Rights, uh, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, the Arab Charter on Human Rights, um, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations Human Rights Declaration. And then there's a reference in the Aarhus Convention, the preamble in Article One, and also the Escazú Agreement. So just this idea of a right to a healthy environment um, has found a home in various attributes of national, subnational, international, um, and regional law. It's also found a home in countries all around the globe. Uh, and there's a little bit of a, like a, de a debate about which country came first because Yugoslavia, which is no longer a country, first recognized a right in 1974 in its constitution. Um, but in the uh, you know, kind of the, the, the constitution that's still operative, the, and the first one to recognize the right to a healthy environment was out of Portugal in 1976, which reads as follows, uh, that everyone shall possess the right to a healthy and ecologically balanced uh, human living environment and the duty to defend it. So 1976, Portugal is the beginning. Uh, and then 20 years later, we, we have what we're celebrating, uh, which in my view is uh, the most, uh, or one of the most uh, uh, important national constitutions uh, uh, recognizing a right to a healthy environment and in creative ways and you know, sometimes frustrating ways. And that of course um, is article 24 of the South African constitution. And you probably know that by heart, so I won't read it back to you. But um, across the globe, uh, this is an idea that's taken hold uh, and by my count in 82 other countries. So a total of 84 countries expressly recognize a right to a healthy environment. When I first looked into this uh, and chronicled the countries that have that recognize an express right to a healthy environment, uh, the, 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 the count was somewhere around 60. That was about 15 years ago. And there's been progressive development uh, in that field in, in recognition of an express right to a healthy environment. Not all of those are enforceable or self-executing. You see, in, in, uh, in a constitution, to, uh, just because uh, the word right is mentioned, it doesn't mean that it's self-enforcing. So of those 84 constitutions, uh, the right to a healthy environment provision uh, appears in the uh, what can be thought of as the action forcing or the self-executing portion of the constitution less than half the time. So, um, so only a, a, a small cohort of the 84 countries uh, make those provisions self-executing. Um, but there are more national developments uh, in ways to advance, uh, if you will, the case for recognizing a right to a healthy environment. In other ways, we don't need, or one doesn't need necessarily an express provision. Uh, for going on 30 years now, uh, courts in countries uh, uh, you know, led by uh, India uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, um, and Sri Lanka have uh, found that other socioeconomic rights impliedly incorporate a right to a healthy environment. Uh, the, uh, the best example is a right to life. So there's a series of cases um, from India, you know, from, you know, again, from beginning 30 years ago, uh, that MC Maida brought, that arguing that a right to life incorporates a right to a healthy environment. And since then, we see similar cases brought in, you know, in Pakistan and elsewhere. That's for a right to life. But more recently, uh, we see cases turning on the right to dignity in constitutions across the globe. You know, the, 
the right to dignity appears in uh, many more, almost twice as many constitutions as the right to a healthy environment, uh, about 160. And so it, it, at least uh, uh, th there's an argument that there's a lot of potential to apply a right to dignity uh, to address environmental shortcomings and challenges. Uh, some leading examples are uh, uh, come from Pakistan, uh, where the Lahore High Court has uh, turned to the right to dignity uh, to, uh, uh, to push for um, progress regarding climate change. But there are, also, there are all sorts of cases all across the globe that have turned to right to dignity provisions in the absence of a right to a healthy environment. Um, so the jurisprudence there is uh, fairly deep and deeper than it is regarding a right to a healthy environment. So by my count, uh, reliably, uh, six nations impliedly recognize a right to a healthy environment. Uh, there are also legislative developments. By my count, uh, among the countries that don't already recognize a right to a healthy environment constitutionally, there are about 23 countries that have legislation that does so, and more study is needed to see the impact that th that legislation has. And then 23 countries that don't already have a right to a healthy environment in their constitutions, um, also ratified the, uh, the African Charter uh, on peoples and human rights that does recognize a right to a healthy environment and is, is uh, largely viewed as the, the only uh, enforceable uh, regional provision uh, among the lot. So that brings us to the question is, does legal recognition of a right to a healthy environment improve environmental outcomes? Um, and that's, you know, really the big question of the day is, you know, to what extent do, do these provisions uh, uh, make for, you know, environmental improvement? Uh, what, what's the added value? And, and the, really, the, the jury is still out on that. Um, so speaking for myself, I firmly uh, support efforts for international, regional, national, subnational recognition of a right to a healthy environment. Um, and, and there's uh, a whole lot of potential for creative thinking about how to operationalize these provisions. Um, so legal recognition, uh, with some exceptions, there's still very modest evidence uh, of improvements in environmental conditions. Uh, there are some simple regression analyses that have been performed uh, about a decade ago uh, that haven't been replicated. Uh, the, the leading studies are by Gellers and Jeffords, uh, and they haven't uh, found, except uh, regarding sanitation, uh, they haven't found uh, a bump, if you will, from legal recognition of a right to a healthy environment. But more, there's more work to be done there, uh, certainly. And just because there, there's not proof of it uh, doesn't mean it's not worth the effort. Um, so uh, part of that is because there are very few cases that where, court, where courts specifically engage a right to a healthy environment. Uh, again, despite that there are 84 nations that do so in all of the international, regional, and subnational layers, there are just very few cases where courts have taken on these provisions, you know, have, have ruled on what the environment means, uh, about what it means to have a healthy environment. You know, I've looked at the noun, I've looked at the adjective. You know, there, there's just very little jurisprudence. Uh, what's there? Um, comes from just you know a few places. South Africa is is one of those places, but with the you know, like the fuel retailers, I don't have to tell you about that. You know, being an example. Of course, there are other examples as well. Um, and uh, in the United States, a leading example is that from the subnational uh, level. It's from the state of Pennsylvania, where um, a, eight years ago, a the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania. You know, it's a big state in the United States. Uh, uh, was construing the Pennsylvania provision and said it's on par with other socioeconomic, civil and political rights and is enforceable. And that's really changed um, the way the law works in Pennsylvania when it comes to the environment and has led to some demonstrable environmental uh, consequences, uh, positive environmental consequences, including regarding fracking in Pennsylvania. Uh, it, but, but mostly, to the, the, you know, there's very little, again, engagement of environmental human rights provisions specifically uh, in cases. And uh, to the extent that there is, you know, courts are really shy about uh, getting to the merits and issuing remedies. The Nor recent Norwegian case uh, is an example of that. And again, there are more examples if you want to you know, investigate them in, in the article. Um, 
there are, are you know, also very, very few decisions from apex courts or constitutional courts construing these provisions. So again, there's, there's a lot of potential for creative uh, lawyering uh, to bring these provisions to life uh, in ways that, um, you know, like Lisa Chamberlain has and others have in South Africa, uh, but elsewhere uh, around the world. Um, uh, so, and also courts that have been asked to uh, uh, just, you know, to rule that there's an unenumerated right to a healthy environment, like in Ireland, you know, lower courts kind of toyed with that idea, but the Supreme Court said, no, there isn't. Um, so again, it's just this general reluctance for courts to, um, to make new law, not everywhere. Again, there are exceptions, uh, but for the most part, uh, there's, there's a lot of work to do. There's also the growth of the rights of nature. Uh, and, and the linkages between that and environmental human rights. And this, you know, this talk and the topic of this conversation largely is about environmental human rights. So we're not talking about harmony with nature or rights of nature expressly, but it's part of the mix. It's part of what informs outcomes uh, regarding the environment. So the kind of, if you will, sort of the quickest way to improve environmental outcomes is by protecting nature. Um, and Ecuador uh, has the only constitution that does that. There are several countries that do it legislatively, um, you know, like uh, uh, Bolivia and uh, New Zealand, of course, and some courts that have done so in India and elsewhere, but those cases have been overturned. So anyway, there's just a lot of, um, a, a lot of potential for uh, the recognition of a right, rights of nature to inform conversations about environmental human rights. There's more work to be done there. Um, and then, uh, so, you know, lastly, is this, you know, case about environmental human rights is that why aren't there more cases? Well, that's really an invitation for those of you who are watching this or listening to this, uh, to think about ways to, um, to bring the rule of law more firmly into focus in the conversation about environmental human rights. There are great arguments for, you know, normative arguments, philosophical arguments. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of potential for, you know, um, for applying rule of law uh, to uh, improve environmental outcomes through the lens of environmental human rights. But, but why aren't there more cases? You might be wondering, right? Well, one reason is that, uh, and the leading reason is what I mentioned earlier about how uh, many of these provisions aren't self-executing. Uh, that is, they're not enforceable without some kind of legislative action. Uh, because they don't appear in the Bill of Rights or the fundamental rights portion of the national constitution. But even if they do, those of you who are litigators, you know, that's, you know, th that, that just kind of barely gets you out of the gate because there are all these obstacles, right, along the way, especially when trying to enforce constitutional rights. Uh, simple things like standing, you know, that is whether the, the litigan litigants have a stake in the outcome and have been injured by an action uh, and can appear in court. Another limitation is jurisdiction. You know, courts, um, uh, you know, some courts are plenary, have plenary jurisdiction. They can hear anything. Others, it's more limited. Uh, some just constitutional claims, some other things. But there can be jurisdictional limitations on the extent to which judges can hear uh, cases sounding in environmental human rights. And then, um, you know, perhaps most of all uh, is just this idea of, separation of powers that you know, courts, but especially when it comes to human rights, uh, that in many places of the world, they just tend to be very shy about recognizing new rights and enforcing them. And again, we get back to, you know, some of these terms are, uh, you know, that they're sort of eternally contested. You know, what is the environment? What is the human environment? What's healthy? What's clean? And so on and so forth. So there's, again, a lot of potential for uh, judges to make law. And uh, judicial training can play a very important role in that process, um, including by recognizing implicit rights. Um, so that is 19 minutes and 55 seconds. I have 20 minutes. And I'll just conclude by saying that international recognition of an environmental human right can help to uh, do all sorts of uh, things to uh, you know, to advance environmental human rights, including redress shortcomings in the law and otherwise, realize potential and catalyze the cause generally. So again, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this program.
congratulations on the 25th anniversary uh, of this wonderful environmental rights provision in the South African Constitution. Thanks, Lisa. So you're on mute. Story of our lives these days, thank you. Um, but I was just saying thanks so much for that and, and not least for, for leading the way on, on timing discipline. Um, but more importantly, for, for really kind of setting the scene of the global scale of, of the recognition of, of environmental rights and the, and the creativity and variety in the ways in which that's done. And also for you know encouraging us to, to interrogate the value um, of, of recognizing environmental rights in this way because you know communities like ours so often operate in a bit of an echo chamber um, and we might take those kind of things as, as, as self-evident and it's really important that that we adopt a, a kind of reflective approach to to strengthen our advocacy for for environmental constitutionalism so thank you I'm going to open up to questions for uh, for Jimmy at this point. I see there's one question from Melanie in the chat, but before we get there, is there anyone that wants to ask a question? You're welcome to uh, to put your hand up, to type your question in the chat, um, or to unmute yourself. Does anyone want to ask a question live before we go to the questions in the chat? Yeah, I'm not seeing any hands, so let's let's move to that. Um, Melanie, would you like to ask your question from the chat live anyway? Sure, I can do that. Um, so I, I do also see Natalie has a, a question as well, so I won't take long. Um, you know, is it measurable in realistic terms to to prove outcomes as a result of rights? Like do and do lawyers have the tools to to engage in that measuring process? Um, I suppose is what my question is. Or can we really only answer much narrower questions like whether rights simply create the potential for for lawmakers to make environmentally friendly laws or create a space for that to happen? Whether the executive then has the duty to implement those laws and and the courts then have the potential to enforce those laws if and when rights-based claims are brought to them. Isn't that all we can really interrogate or do you think we're being too not ambitious enough? Um, Jimmy, oh, Jimmy, sorry. Uh, before you respond, uh, I just want to add uh, a comment from, from the chat just because it's relevant from, from Susanna who's saying um, she's she's agreeing with some of the points that Melanie's making and uh, her point that for this to happen, a community has to have a great deal of luck in getting the legal representation they need to, to turn things into a court case. Um, and then maybe we can just take Natalie's question and you can respond to both together. Um, Natalie, do you want to unmute and ask your question live or should we, otherwise I'll just read from the chat. Uh, yeah, you're, you're welcome to read it from the chat, um, or I could read it from the chat. <laughs> it's, always, it's always nice to have a bit of live participation. I oh, think sorry. All... Okay, sure. Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, we're all disembodied over Zoom. Um, so I just wondered if in developing country context, there's the potential for certain rights to be valued over others, given, you know, the sort of checkered history in some countries like our own, um, where certain elements of human rights are prized over, over other rights and it's sort of an unspoken or unwritten hierarchy, perhaps. Um, so maybe just James's comment on, on that. Thanks, Natalie. Why don't you go ahead and respond, Jimmy? Okay, thank you for all those questions. And I know there's limited time. So again, forgive me for brevity. It's no reflection on these wonderful questions, but uh, first, beginning with Melanie's question uh, about, uh, you know, is this the work that lawyers can do or should be expected to do? Um, I, I don't know. You know, uh, there is a question when lawyers have to make a case uh, as to what the evidence is. Uh, I don't think that lawyers are in the best position to develop the evidence concerning the effectiveness of uh, human rights-based responses to you know challenges to the human condition 
But there are the social sciences that do that. So with environmental human rights, what, I, you know, what, uh, what could happen, perhaps what should happen, is uh, rather than lawyers and law professors writing more about environmental human rights, uh, that this should be uh, an area of investigation and interrogation for the social sciences. It, there is a field that does just this thing, it, it, that tries to evaluate the effectiveness of rights-based approaches, like rights to water and rights to education and rights to health. So there's certainly um, you know, a tradition of doing that. Uh, if, you know, by my view, by my eye, uh, the evidence at this point in time is thin, um, and it would be uh, it would be useful if it were thicker. Um, on the question uh, about um, hierarchies, yeah, that's a great question, uh, and I don't have a great answer, but it it's uh, you know it's um, it's wrapped up in you know, <laughs> colonialism uh, and racism and opportunism and ethnocide and genocide and history about these hierarchies. And, but, but here's where rights can make a difference. Uh, I don't mean everywhere all the time, you know, not a panacea, but they are a tool. And constitutionalizing a right, as we all know, you know, makes, uh, ascends that right uh, over others or other, over other values, it protects it and makes it durable. And so that too can happen with environmental rights. But there are trade-offs, and maybe this is where the question is going. So recognizing environmental human rights might come at the expense, right, of a right to work, or a right to education, um, or a right, you know, other rights that could be compromised. So I don't know if that's where the question was going, but that's another facet of this kind of headlong enthusiasm for environmental human rights, where there might be, you know, uh, an argument for more reflection. Thanks so much, Jimmy. I am aware that you might need to, to step out to go and do the important work of uh, training up the next generation of environmental activists um, in the classroom. So uh, just to thank you very much for sharing your, your, your time and the, and the real depth of your knowledge in, in this area with us. So, so thanks very much for joining us. We'll thank let you, you go. Uh, thank you. I'll hold on for Melanie's uh, talk and then at that time I'll have to to beg up, but thank you everyone again. See you. Great, thanks. Over to you, Melanie. Hi, is it showing the slides? Perfect. Great. So I think this presentation builds on nicely from where Jim left off because it's, a, it's more of an in-country study and it's looking at how environmental constitutionalism can be enforced in a particular way um, or implemented in a particular way in climate litigation so as to recognize um, the, the justice issues that flow from environmental degradation, including in the context of, of climate change and some of the impacts of climate change. So um, it, it's developing a, a legal theory that's formed part of my doctoral thesis and um, that will hopefully gain more traction as time goes on. Um, and the theory is called transformative constitution, rather transformative environmental constitutionalism. And that theory brings together environmental constitutionalism's idea of protecting the environment through constitutionally entrenched provisions with transformative constitutionalism's agenda of using the South African constitution to pursue widespread societal change in pursuit of social justice. So the goal of transformative environmental constitutionalism is to optimize the constitution's entrenchment of an environmental right in a way that's aligned with the overarching social justice imperative of the constitution. And in response to, to the comment that was just raised about a hierarchy of rights, the argument is that we cannot secure human flourishing or fulfill any other right in the constitution without a well-functioning environment all of those other rights become meaningless. 
And so transformative environmental constitutionalism tries to say that we must pursue these rights as interconnected concerns rather than seeing them as at odds with one another. And where there are potential conflicts, we must resolve those resisting false binaries because often the binaries are false. So the premise of, of environmental con transformative environmental constitutionalism is that environmental destruction is a social justice issue. There can be no social justice as required by the constitution unless we have environmental and climate justice. All of these concerns are interconnected and this interconnectedness must be recognized in the implementation, application, development and interpretation of environmental laws including in the context of climate litigation, which ought to acknowledge that the poor are first and hardest hit by climate change. And to really bring this home, um, I thought I'll show you a very short video courtesy of um, Ground Up. Let's see if this works. I actually uh, don't even have a place uh, to go, so I I think I'm gonna have to stay a while with uh, some things. So these dire circumstances, which are in uh, Cape Town earlier this year, as a result of extreme weather events, um, very serious flooding, um, should create the impetus for all of us to acknowledge that um, humans are first of all de driving ecological destruction. That behavior causes not only climate change in an abstract scientific sense, but human suffering, because when the environment suffers, people suffer, and the poor, as we see here very vividly, are first and hardest hit. And the climate crisis that we currently face is setting South Africa back in the fulfillment of its project of transformative constitutionalism, because as poverty and inequality deepen, it's becoming harder for South Africa to shift towards the kind of society envisaged by the constitution one founded on dignity, equality, and social justice. So we need responses fundamentally different to the ones you would have seen in this video if, we're avoid, if we are to avoid the specter of a climate apartheid that the, the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment uh, have been speaking about. So how do we then change things? What paradigm helps us to think differently about these problems? Well, I think this, uh, this short video and hopefully the introduction has got us thinking that social justice is connected with, with climate justice. And then what is climate justice really all about? Well, I'd urge you to, to read the climate justice charter that was finalized and presented by a range of civil society organizations and communities uh, collectively in August 2020. It's a wonderful document that, it, that offers um, an alternative to what we often see as these false binaries in terms of protecting the environment or advancing jobs or pursuing economic gain against environmental protection. And um, it tells us that we need to think of our world differently and we need to reimagine our relationships with the environment if we are to, to live in a just and equitable society and prevent further environmental destruction. And, um, and so hopefully I, I would at least encourage you to have a look at this and think about how in your work on environmental protection, this particular document could be uh, used and, and um, amplified in the South African context, 
because it's very much complementary to the environmental right and the fulfillment of that right. So what is then climate litigation and how does all of this, what I've been saying, speak to climate litigation? That is bare bones, climate litigation includes lawsuits, regardless of the forum, it could be administrative, judicial or, or investigatory, that raises issues of law or fact regarding the science of climate change, um, mitigation and adaptation, uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation efforts. And um, in America, there's a, a thousand, over a thousand climate cases. In South Africa, we, are, we have a very small handful. And I think we need to, to make more of, of our, our potential of our environmental rights in the context of climate litigation, because it can be such a powerful tool when it is used. Why do I say it can be a powerful tool? Well, particularly when in, used with reference to, um, at least with reference to transformative environmental constitutionalism, um, climate change litigation can invite us to, to think about the ways in which social, environmental and climate justice are linked and then advance those goals, the, those important ideas in a collective or interconnected way. And we can do this in the courts despite the inherent li limitations of um, litigation. So of course, law, law is inherently um, limited. It cannot change the world. It, it needs actors to use it and, and we need to fight for that. And, and as lawyers try and make that happen as much as we can. So in spite of the inherent limitations, which I, I don't wanna be naive about, there are a number of important things that we can do when we do take matters to court. And when we do take matters to court, we must use all the weapons in our arsenal to fight climate change and to pursue climate justice. And this is because particularly in South Africa, courts are very important agents of social transformation, or at least they can be. They can play an, an accountability enhancing role in pursuit of improved environmental governance. And we've seen that, for example, in the Earth Life case. They can also play an important storytelling role by bringing the social, environmental, and climate justice dimensions of disputes into the public domain, where they have a much wider audience than they might otherwise have. And by making authoritative pronouncements, um, courts can legitimize concerns about environmental issues and encourage policy shifts. And so these are all, despite the limitations of litigation, things that can be done. And if we're going to take the time to go to court, we must make the most of it. So how do we do that? Well, the theory of transformative environmental constitutionalism tries to um, strengthen climate litigation in pursuit of, of social, environmental, and climate justice as interconnected concerns. First of all, it says, when you take the matter to court for, for the environment and for the people in the environment, frame the, the matter in a way that, that places the social, environmental, and justice concerns center stage and, and force the court to grapple with those injustices. Um, avoid treating the matter as purely technical or purely procedural. Um, not that you can't use those procedural and technical arguments, but avoid keeping the justice issues at the periphery or not bringing them to the fore. So it, it urges lawyers to do that and judges to also do that. Second of all, transformative environmental constitutionalism encourages a rights-based approach to litigation focused on the environmental right. So linking a claim directly to the environmental right, whenever environmental destruction or climate change impacts are at play and really showing in a very explicit way how these issues are connected. Thirdly, um, there's a, a transformative environmental constitutionalism encourages transformative adjudication entailing meaningful reliance on substantive principles embedded in our law, such as public trusteeship and environmental justice. Um, we don't have time to go into them now, 
but those um, principles are massively underutilized in our law and could facilitate a much more substantive um, adjudication of environmental disputes than we currently see. Also urging the court to develop the normative content of the right. So telling, getting the court to tell us how a particular problem is connected to the right and what the right actually means in this particular context especially with a focus on our environmental rights, um, ecologically sustainable development uh, clause and the intergenerational and intragenerational content. So we've got some powerful tools in the right that are again, largely underutilized and the, we need to urge the court to make more of those to strengthen the case for the environment. And lastly, transformative environmental constitutionalism says, rely on the environmental right in conjunction with other relevant, mutually reinforcing and interrelated substantive rights, such as the right to access to water, the right to access to food and the rights to culture. So that kind of gives you an idea of what the components of this theory are. And then I wanted to show you how it can be, it plays out a little bit in a practical example. And to do this, I, I was going to speak about the Earth Life case, but I decided it's a bit more current to speak about the Philippi Horticultural Association judgment. And I'll let um, the, the main litigant in the case tell you a little bit about the context first. This is our sports care production farm, and this is the farm model of the future that we're developing in the PHA. And I think this is something that the government will have to take seriously to take a look at this so that we can understand how can we create jobs, um, provide people with good food and, and care for the environment all at the same time. So that very brief um, introduction from um, Mr. Sunday, tell, who's one of the main activists in the Philippi Horticultural Association, um, tells us a bit about the site of the dispute. The dispute was about the Philippi Horticultural Area Food and, and Farming Campaign, who wanted to protect the survival of the Philippi Horticultural Area and therefore opposed a proposed urban development of housing, schools, commercial and industrial and other facilities. And the campaign said that the area, which is farmed largely by emerging farmers, was the most productive and unique urban agricultural hub in the country contributed towards food security of impoverished people in the area and employed around 6,000 farm workers. The success of farming in the area was attributed to a considerable degree to an abundance, um, even in times of drought, of groundwater from an aquifer in the area. And it was argued that urban creep, including the uh, proposed development, would threaten the aquifer and the farming activities in the area. And the case is an instance of climate change litigation because it raised the climate ad adaptation and resilience issue of law, um, issue of law as to whether the state's failure to consider the impacts of an urban development on an aquifer in the context of water scarcity and climate change was a basis to review and set aside the approval of the urban development. And because of time, I won't go into the details, but the court said, yes, um, climate change and water scarcity are relevant considerations that should be taken into account fully and properly by um, the municipality in this case and other authorities before approving an urban development. And the, uh, the failure to take these considerations into account was a basis in administrative law to set the approval of the urban development aside. And so the court reviewed and set aside the approval of the urban development. So a win for the Philippi horticultural um, area. And importantly, by recognizing the need to properly consider the impacts of the urban development um, and, um, and the rezoning on an aquifer with reference to the community's water scarcity uh, issues and concerns, the court ad adopted a justice-oriented approach and advanced equitable access to water consistent with transformative environmental constitutionalism. 
The court acknowledged that the community was reliant on the water for their farming activities and treated those activities as legitimate. And the court adopted this approach with reference to the environmental right, such that as in Earth Life Africa, judicial review of administrative action on the grounds of a failure to take into account relevant considerations was utilized to enhance environmental protection. But let's consider more carefully whether the court applied transformative constitutionalism in the context of this important climate so litigation. So did the court frame the dispute with a reference to with a justice oriented approach, first of all? Well, if you read the judgment, you can see, yes, the court very much did so. The court said that the Philippi horticultural area's survival was at issue and recognized that this, issue, this area was an irreplaceable community farmland. And so that the court proceeded from that point of departure. And the court said that what was required in the case was a more recent assessment of the health of the aquifer and the impact that the proposed development would have given climate change and water scarcity in the area. So the court recognized the connection between people and the environment and recognized the legitimate needs of the horticultural association. Did the court adopt a rights-based approach? Yes. The court said that NEMA, which was the relevant legislation at issue in granting the approval, should be interpreted purposefully in a manner consistent with our environmental rights with regard to the context of the legislation. And um, the court also said in relation to the aquifer, an assessment of the impact of the development on it, having right regard to the rights set out in section 24, um, required consideration. So the court very much looked at the right in reaching its conclusion. But did the court engage in transformative adjudication in a meaningful way? Well, um, probably yes and no. Um, so in some, the court did apply a purpose of interpretation, but the court wasn't very open about which principles informed its judgment uh, the court could have gone much further in developing the normative content of the right, for example. So the transformative adjudication part is thin in the judgment. It's there, but it's thin. Did the court develop the normative content of the right? No, again, not really. Um, so we can't really use, um, it, there's an important precedent that emerges from this judgment, but it's limited in value. The court could have gone further to tell us exactly what it is about section 24 that allowed it to come to its conclusion rather than making a passing reference. And then was the environmental rel right relied on in conjunction with other relevant rights, such as the community's right to access to water and food? Not at all. And even if the, the attorneys for Philippi Horticultural Association didn't raise those rights, the court is empowered to take those rights on Meromotu and engage with them and, and didn't do so. And perhaps it's asking too much, but we must start asking the court to do more. So to conclude then, the court did well in Philippi Horticultural Association to advance climate justice for the people concerned, but the court could have gone further. And hopefully this analysis showing how transformative environmental constitutionalism works and how it worked to a degree in that case shows how it could do more in future climate cases to advance the important goal of climate justice within the broader framework of our social justice oriented constitution. Thanks. Thanks, Melanie. I'm sorry to rush you, um, but thanks so much for, uh, for for sharing your thoughts around the, uh, the transformative environmental constitutionalism uh, theory that you've been developing. And just to say that, you know, for those of us that have been engaged in environmental justice work in practice, that binary, you know, that that false binary that you talk about between environmental issues and social justice is something we've been railing about for the longest time. And it's incredibly helpful now to to have a theoretical framework with which to respond to to that problem in practice. Uh, and it's also a hell of a useful thing to be able to to prescribe to students as well. So thank you so much for your contribution. Um, I've also picked up some valuable tips on, on the creative use of emoticons as well. So, <laughs> so thanks for that.
Um, all right, I will move on now to Pasquale, over to you. Hi, thank you very much. And I'm trying to share the, the screen actually here. Can you see the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, we can, thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Lisa, and um, many, many thanks to the Environmental Association, to Melanie Marcot, uh, for organizing this really inspiring panel. This one is the title, Constitutionalisms and the Environment from Different Viewpoints, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Um, I will try to provide some forwards on the, on the words constitution or constitutions and constitutionalism according to a more theoretical approach uh, if compared with uh, the previous presentations. And then I will focus on the constitutionalization of the environment versus the concept, the theoretical concept of environmental constitutionalism. And then uh, I will deal with three different perspectives or lenses from which legal scholars, uh, basically com constitutional law scholars and comparative law scholars used to uh, address environmental constitutionalism. So under the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, lens, like the Sergio Leone's movie with uh, Clint Eastwood. And then a few conclusions just to, to uh, open uh, the debate. Constitution and constitutionalism uh, both suffered as words, uh, a very huge issue for a, a specific stage of their lives. They become uh, vacant terms. So terms or words available for, for a new employment and with the term constitutionalism, we used to, to uh, like refer to the historical model uh, coming from uh, as an outcome of the um, independence war of the United States of America or the French Revolution and then the narrative of equality and freedom and so on. But during decades, uh, um, scholars used to highlight the structural meaning and the functional meaning and use of constitutionalism. And it became a sort of uh, ideal type in a barbarian sense, in a barbarian me meaning, or a, as an archetype, more or less, or even an achievement, or a, in, in the Nicholas Luhmann words, an evolutionary achievement. So constitutionalism is a sort of task and, uh, or a, a, an objective. And the legal system are trying or are striving to reach such kind of objective. And one of the definitions that I, that I honestly prefer is the one provided by Latin, that this constitutionalism is the political theory that generally accompanies the technique. Uh, of course, uh, we have different constitutional experiences um, that are inspired by autonomous or context-related forms of constitutionalism. And uh, uh, scholars uh, find that some specific features of this phenomena uh, and they tried to summarize such features uh, within an adjective to be prevented to the known constitutionalism, like for this reason we have authoritarian, for instance, or post-authoritarian, global, neoconstitutionalism, and so on. So uh, I would like to, to uh, okay, where is this? Okay. So I would like to just to deal with three selected forms of constitutionalism that are transformative constitutionalism, global constitutionalism and the Nuevo Constitutionalismo Latinoamericano, in English is the new uh, Latin American constitutionalism. About transformative constitutionalism, Melanie, I completely share the Melanie Marco uh, position. I would just uh, add one thing, that in this process, in this shift, uh, thanks Melanie for allowing me to save some time, uh, that in this process of shifting from the old to the new in this sort of rite of passage, uh, we should understand what is transformed and what is left intact. Um, as also Vendra Bakshi suggests about transformative constitutionalism. And uh, we should understand this within the contrast between continuity and change to define dominant, emergent, and residual cultures, addressing multiple and intersecting inequality. inequalities. Let's shift to global constitutionalism. Um, when we refer to global constitutionalism, we are not dealing with uh, domestic legislation or with a proper constitutional frame, but with, um, uh, in, we are referring to international law, basically, uh, to a concept of multi-level governance uh, that is demanding uh, systemic coherence. 
uh, it means more or less that there is an emerging trend or an emerging global standard within this framework that is provided by post-national governments. So, uh, it shares some features with domestic or national constitutionalism, but only in a rudimentary form. Um, in fact, global constitutionalism absolutely is not a classical form of constitutionalization. Um, of course, not a form of hierarchization of norms, because the hierarchization or legalization of norms are not like a proper constitutionalization of a concept of, or um, of a specific theory and so on. But global constitutionalism is a, an academic and political agenda which identifies and advocates the application of constitutionalist principles. And one important feature is that global constitutionalism uh, deploys a constructive, not obstructive, critical potential in the works by N. Peters. Then let's go to the third selective form of constitutionalism of this afternoon presentation, that is the neo constitutionalism Latin America. Personally, I find it really interesting because it is not absolutely the neo-constitutionalism. This one is another form of constitutionalism, the nuevo constitutionalism, that, uh, constitutionalism, that in English is new constitutionali uh, constitutionalism. And uh, what is interesting is that such kind of constitutionalization of some claims came from uh, 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 popular claims or social movements and not from a merely, merely legal debate. And uh, uh, in an analysis uh, provided by Vigia Vega Mengol, um, th this author underlined 14 features of the Nuevo Constitutionalism Latin Americano. And I would ask for your attention on two points. The, the number three, that are the aspirational aspects of the Nuevo Constitutionalism Latin Americano, um, as well as teleological and axiological provisions and this feature is really, really close to the concept of transformative constitutionalism and also uh, uh, to the concept of transformative environmental constitutionalism. And point number one, uh, number nine, sorry, that is really avant-garde recognition of constitutional rights and new legal subjectivities. Uh, then we will see what happened in the constitution of Ecuador and the constitution of Bolivia, for instance. Now let's apply the concept of environment to these three selective forms of constitutionalism. About transformative environmental constitutionalism, I, as I said, shared the Melanie Marco position, also in reference to climate change mitigation. Um, and I would add that, uh, um, of course, Melanie uh, focused on the South African experience, but in my opinion, uh, her ideas can, and her thesis can easily migrate into other legal systems dealing with social justice concerns, uh, whether they are within the global south or the western legal tradition. About global constitutionalism, it seems to nurture environmental expectations, uh, but there is no international environmental legal vision that we can refer to as a proper constitutional order. Furthermore, uh, as Bodansky affirms, uh, uh, the body of principles of international environmental law uh, uh, is really weak and bad, and then uh, according, according to the fact that they are a very different meaning, uh, they have the exercise real constraint on the behavior of states or international institutions. Furthermore, there is no part space for individuals and private corporations. So, so uh, for this reason, global constitutionalism seems to nurture environmental expectations, but is not a proper form of global environmental constitutionalism, as we can say. About the Neo Constitutionalism Latin Americano, uh, as I said, it's quite interesting because uh, they uh, placed within their constitutions transformative claims based on extra legal concepts, on, on cultural, um, on, on their own cultural, chthonic, and autochthonous traditions. An example is the 2008 Constitution of Ecuador that within the preamble celebrates, it, it uh, doesn't recognize or it doesn't. Uh, recalls, uh, recall uh, just the concept of Mother Earth, but it celebrates nature of Pachamama. And in Article 71, it even provides uh, for a definition, sort of definition that is far from a definition based on, on space and time, because the, this concept of Pachamama is, is something more, uh, is really close to, to a cosmogonic approach of this sort of theoretical place where life is reproduced and of course we all belong to this uh, theoretical place. 
And then the 2009 Constitution of the Provincial State of Bolivia that also provides a framework, provides a, a suitable framework for the nature of the study. Um, even there is no direct constitutional provision uh, who allow for the, uh, who provide for the nature of the but then uh, there have been the, the delay, the derechos de la madre tierra, and treaty of course in 2010, providing for, for a, a proper nature of the Let's shift now to con the constitutionalization of the environment, to environmental constitutionalism. I've been a member of a research project on environmental constitutionalism. So uh, briefly, we um, uh, like uh, tried to find all the environmental provisions in UN members' constitutions. Then we divided constitu constitutions, countries' constitutions by continents, and we divided them in 10 phases, and then we classified or and we tried to provide a sort of taxonomy according to different types of constitutional provisions. This is the, uh, the, the time frame, so different time periods. Then we adopted this classification uh, made by Domenico Mirante, who is an Italian law scholar, uh, uh, not a law scholar. Uh, in, we divided them in environmental constitutions, then in revised constitutions. So in this second, um, second Constitution, those, constitu these, those constitutions where the word environment and environmental provisions were placed after an amendment, for instance, and then silent constitutions, so constitutions that do not provide any uh, actual or any law in reference to uh, any law in reference to the environment. And then uh, we classified them according to this uh, scheme that is uh, uh, based on ideal facts and constitutional provisions. Uh, so right, duty, directive, principle, indirect, indirect protection, non-environmental provisions. And the classif this classification is based on the increasing protection. So we placed uh, the constitution, for instance, with a specific right provision uh, in the box with right-based constitu right constitutions, even uh, in case there was like also, uh, um, there were also provisions related to duties so or directive principles and so on. So according to an increase protection of the environment. As first, uh, we found that there is no definition of the term environment uh, in the constitutions. And this is a, a chart just to simplify the trend of constitutions that, were, that are actually silent on environmental matter. This is the trend of, uh, in reference to the indirect enforcement. Almost the same is for directive principles and here for duties. While for right since the 90s, so there is a, a decreasing trend for duties since the 90s. While about rights, there is like a very standard and a very straight line uh, till uh, today. Uh, what happened dividing by contents? This is Africa. So Africa, for instance, um, follows the, the general, the global trend here, as you can see. Um, okay, now there is a, a whole debate about which constitutions, of course. Uh, uh, there are constitutions who are like in a certain way imposed by international organizations and other constitutions that are, as to say, autochthons. Uh, of course, uh, this is another, another story. But uh, as you can see, the trend in Africa is the same as the global trend. But it is not like this uh, everywhere in, in each continent, because, for instance, in Asia, uh, there isn't a proper trend that is like close to the global one. So let's see how constitutional law scholars and, and comparative law scholars look at environmental constitutionalism. Uh, we all here agree about environmental constitutionalism, but there are a lot of scholars uh, that publish for uh, Oxford University Press, Cambridge University Press, and so on, that they completely uh, don't share our position about, uh, about environmental constitutionalism. So I, just to simplify, divide it. The, the, these three different approaches uh, according to this very easy and simple classification, ironic classification, it is the good, bad, and the bad. So the good one is the one that I think uh, to, to which we all belong. This is the good lens. So we consider maybe environmental constitutionalism uh, as the current legal response to cope with the present global socio-ecological crisis, so addressing the cast of our legal frameworks, able to foster adaptation and mitigation, here there's also climate change concerns. So adaptation and mitigation actions along with the early environmental laws commitments of conservation and restoration, and thus promoting also a legal approach that is 
uh, that is looking towards a sort of integrated technologies. And then there is the bad lens. So according to some others, uh, environmental constitutionalism is like the evidence, so it proves that environmental law is suffering an aging pro process, uh, um, uh, and uh, this process is ossifying environmental law. According to them, environmental law uh, needs and requires flexibility. And in a certain, to a certain extent, is uh, also true, such kind of position. Uh, but they have done it a, a sort of, um, as I say, green arthritis, uh, that is like a limit for environmental, uh, environmental law. And as I said, environmental constitutionalism is the evidence of such aging process. And then there is the agreements. Uh, I find this really uh, sometimes also offensive. Uh, I think it's, it's right, this word, to, to explain this theoretical position of some constitutional law scholars or comparative law scholars. Uh, they, uh, they like show that this tendency to associate environmentalism with studies in environmental legislation. So they merge conceptually social movements and legal analysis. And uh, um, for them, environmental constitutionalism uh, appear redundant and then restricted also by the international environmental regime, as well as the domestic uh, legislation. And for them, uh, environmental constitutionalism or, or this concept is like a sort of new age attempt to rejuvenate all these courses. And uh, in the words of some of them, uh, it seems to be a dialogue among advocates without skeptics. So uh, this is the, the ugly position uh, from which it is possible to look at the environmental constitutionalism. Uh, really few remarks about the conclusion. So do constitutions matter? For sure, yes. Uh, although uh, we think that the international law regime is, may seem best suited to address climate and environmental challenges, but um, uh, of course, uh, some environmental problems, in the words of May and Jim uh, was here before, problems transcend national borders, but solutions are most likely to be implemented locally, of course. And uh, constitutions are important because they are like trade union between international and domestic law, uh, balancing the generality of cases with local context as legal apparatus as well for the enforcement and implementation of policies. And then uh, environmental constitutionalism is not just the evidence of an aging process, it's also the, the, the evidence uh, of the awareness of, of the current global social ecological crisis and um, constitutions as well as legal system uh, then I, I'd like trying to cope with such, such issues through uh, state positive obligations and individual rights and duties, procedural environmental rights, several other peculiar environmental provisions. And um, the majority of these tools are enforceable. And um, so only in a few cases, there is a predominance of, of civil and political rights on environmental uh, rights. Uh, and uh, uh, this trend, uh, the constitutionalization of the environment proves the environment's rising path as human value, not just constitutional value, but as human value. And this thesis is like similar to the one uh, offered by Boyd in reference to the right to health environment. To conclude, uh, the, ascent, the ascent of the environment as a constitutional matter or to be associated with social values is demonstrated by different but converging provisions. And, uh, the theoretical framework of this converging process is environmental constitutionalism. And furthermore, legal systems and public governance are undertaken to accommodate such legal newcomer, that is the environment in a certain way. The main effect is a holistic attitude that impacts on legal systems, and uh, the constitutional law field then impacts on the domestic legal system and governance, fostering legal responses that can be structural and systemic or individual or incremental as well as through the constitutionalization of the environment that helps to frame an enforceable scheme that allows other courts to deal with such issues and to harmonize legal interpretations within subordinate judicial levels. Thank you. Thank you so much for that input. 
And I really do want to, to echo um, the acknowledgement that Melanie put into the, to the chat about the amount of work that, that you've obviously been uh, engaged with. Uh, we, we know that so often something like a, a graph that can appear for a minute or two in a PowerPoint is actually the results of, of months, if not years of work. And so we're deeply appreciative of, of all of the legwork that you've done and, and, and your willingness to, to share the results of that with us. And I must also apologize to-, sharing, to Mel sharing, Sorry, my oh, sharing okay. is also with a very short of brief because yesterday night, I, yesterday evening, I got the second shot of that scene. So I'm completely out of brief, so sorry. <laughs> it's really- not, not a problem at all. <laughs> um, we're, we're all grappling with that at the moment. And just pleased that you're vaccinated. Um, uh, and also just what I was going to say is just to apologize to, to Melanie for completely changing the structure of, of uh, this this panel midstream. Um, I, I, had a, I had a sort of absent moment and forgot to pause for questions. So what we're going to do is just run through all the presentations and then uh, do questions all at the end. So over to you, Amy. Great, thank you. I'm going to just share my screen. Okay, uh, can everyone see that fine? I hope so. Yes, Great. it's perfect. Okay, awesome. So um, it's morning for me. So good morning, everyone, uh, afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm really happy to be with you today. I'm excited, even though it's a virtual conference, to be a part of it, discussing uh, the right to environment. I want to say a very big thank you to the organizers of the event for having me. Uh, it's a topic that is extremely important to me uh, as an individual and in the work that I do um, as an animal lawyer. So my topic today is gonna to be exploring the interactions and opportunities for human and non-human animals within the environmental right. Uh, and to be honest, I actually really struggled with this uh, presentation because there are so many different ways in which non-human animals are impacted by the constitutional right to environment. And there's so many opportunities uh, to use the constitution to improve uh, protection for them as well as for human animals. So as I tend to do, I always put in a lot more than I should in the time I'm allocated. So uh, if I have to conclude early, I hope that these are some of the conclusions that you will take away and consider or you know, raise some questions or debate within you. The current crisis really means that we need to move away from a purely anthropocentric viewpoint that we've held for so long. Uh, I submit that this has failed us. We cannot consistently fail to include and consider the other inhabitants of our planet planet. Human rights and particularly the right to environment are actually enhanced, enhanced and better achieved by the consideration of the interests of non-human animals. And as such, we can use that right and interpret that right to include them. And the courts have done this. And I'll give you some examples exactly of how. Animals are sentient beings. They have intrinsic value as individuals. And as such, they should be legally protected in law and policy. And, and this must be done at an individual level as well as at a broader level as part of the environment and as a species. So constitutional values in fact require this, so does transformative constitutionalism, and I'm very happy that Melanie spoke about that, and the highest courts in the country have recognized this, so it's no longer a pie in the sky idea, it actually has practical application. The government is failing on various fronts to meet these constitutional obligations. It has obligations and duties to do this and uh, government must be held accountable. And I'm gonna give some specific examples of how they aren't doing this. And actually we need to work together. Um, and I'm very happy to be around a lot of environmental lawyers because usually I'm around animal lawyers and I think there's a massive overlap. So I think environmental lawyers, human rights lawyers and animal lawyers should be working together because there is so much overlap. And as a final point, I will say that animal protection is a social justice issue. Okay, so some very quick background. I think it's important sometimes to zoom out before we look at the very specifics of an issue. So I'm going to go zoom way out to looking at Earth, our beautiful blue planet, which is 4.54 billion years old. I'm not going to read those figures because there are a lot, but it's really to explain the vastness of, of, of our planet and how big it is. And um, who are the inhabitants? Well, we have over 5 million fungal species. We have over 390,000 species of plants and approximately 7 million species of animals. We don't know, so none of these figures are particularly accurate, but it's really to put into perspective that there are millions of species that inhabit this planet with us, including us, human animal species. Okay, so who are rights holders? Well, 
only one of those millions of species are right holders, homo sapiens, AKA human animals. Okay, this obviously has massive implications for everyone else. How are we doing with those human rights? Not particularly well, as we've seen. Uh, unfortunately, we're in a state of crises. It's not limited to the environmental crisis we see. We have social, political, economic crises. Uh, the world is in a state of indignity, discrimination, inequality, injustice, and oppression. And all of this is relevant to our constitutional right to environment, as well as our treatment of animals. And I put this down to the fact that we have this separateness or exclusionary approach, right? Humans tend to separate and divide themselves among one another. We see this manifest in our society through inequality and through various isms. We see this division between humans and our own environment, which has led to the, the degradation and uh, the crises that we're currently in. And the one that I'm gonna to touch on today is the division and separateness between humans and non-human animals. And we do this not only in law and policy, but through the use of euphemistic terms, the way we talk about them. Uh, and we use this to justify how we exploit and use them. This is often done behind closed doors on a massive, massive scale. And really the relationship between human animals and non-human animals is one of dom domination and commodification. And as as individuals and as a society, we are all complicit in a system which based purely on the numbers, which is trillions of animals that are killed every year, is the most violent and unjust in all of history. So as I've, uh, as I've submitted, this approach has failed us. So let's take a little bit of a dive into the constitution. What I'm going to focus on in addition to the environmental right is really the obligations of the state and government. So obviously they are bound by the specific constitutional rights. They have, um, they have a duty and obligation to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill these rights. And this is obviously particularly even more so in those rights that have progressive realization provisions and the environmental right is one of those. This is done through the three branches, the legislature, executive, and judiciary. And I put stars next to the judiciary because I believe that they, at this current stage, hold the most opportunities to improve protection for non-human animals because of some of the cases that we've seen arise, which I'll also touch on. And another important thing I want to touch on is that this new constitution is really a shift away from parliamentary sovereignty to a culture of justification. And that culture of justification must be prevalent in all of our law laws and policies, and we must hold government to it. And in that context, other relevant provisions which come into play include just administrative action, the limitation of rights, which will obviously come up in the context of non-human animals, and then this interpretation of how we interpret the Bill of Rights. And as I mentioned, the accountability is absolutely critical, right? In many instances, the government is not only uh, infringing on these rights, but they are promoting activities which are extremely harmful, exploitative, and problematic. So just to give another kind of outlook is the preamble to the constitution mentions that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. And if we look at non-human animals in the context of the constitution, they are not mentioned at all in the Bill of Rights. In fact, the only place that they're explicitly mentioned are in the schedules to the constitution, which really deals with the competencies of government to deal with the various issues that impact and affect them, whether it's environment or agriculture or pounds, et cetera. So uh, this is problematic because of the, the concurrent competencies we've seen in consistent legislation at a national level, at a provincial level, where it comes to the environment, there's inconsistencies between the provinces themselves, there's a lot of passing the buck, there's a lot of gaps and loopholes that have traditionally and historically been exploited to the detriment of non-human animals and the environment. There's also this relationship between the environmental and agricultural department where we see that neither of them want to take really responsibility for the welfare of wild animals, which is extremely problematic when we have practices like wildlife farming, which I'm going to touch on too. So there's really the law has been set up almost to be this perfect storm where animals are left in this lost space and not properly legally protected. There's also old outdated laws that don't actually re properly reflect our practices and our current status quo. So uh, enforcement is obviously just a general problem too. Animals are considered as property in the law. They are legal objects. So that legal subject, legal object divide becomes very prevalent because the rights of 
ownership don't necessarily come with corresponding duties of care and the rights to properly protect the interests of those animals, right? So their use is consistently promoted. Government is always uh, promoting the use of animals in pursuit of other objectives, right? Whether these are economic or social, food security, things like that. Um, but in fact, a number of rights in our constitutional rights are impacted by use of animals. I'm going to talk about the environmental right, but there are others. So this includes the right to water and others. I'm not going to read the full right to environment, but just to give a quick kind of comparison as to where we are in the achievement of these. So obviously we have a right to the environment that is not harmful to our health and well-being. One thing I want to contextualize is that Obviously, animals are part of the environment too. So all of these ill effects that we are seeing happening to human animals are equally happening to non-human animals, whether it's, it's pollution, water, air, soil pollution, all of these things. They are equally impacting on non-human animals who are often the invisible victims within the system. To have the environment protected for the benefit of present and future generations. Okay, so obviously future generations of humans, but if we look at the massive species decline, the loss in biodiversity, the six mass extinction, things like that, the, the future generations of non-human animals is also not looking bright for them. There's the many species are on the brink of collapse, are vulnerable, are threatened, are increasingly critically endangered. And this one is the one I really kind of want to focus on is through reasonable legislative and other measures. And I'm going to highlight a few more specific examples of these. But if one looks at some of the more recent policies and, and laws that government has been putting out, um, I, I would submit that it's, it's very hard to justify that the right to environment is being considered properly and adequately in these contexts. And you'll see there the examples of agricultural animals. So people would also tend to think of the right to environment to think only of wild animals. And I submit that we must also include agricultural animals in there and specifically agricultural practices, right? So if we look at the master poultry plan, which intends to greatly increase the number of poultry who are killed every year. Um, we're also looking at the domestic trade, uh, or sorry, the live export trade out of the country. All of these practices are impacting on our environmental right. We also have, and I apologize, there will be a few uh, graphic images. I don't mean to upset anybody. I've tried to keep these minimal. Um, to prevent pollution, again, this is the pollution doesn't only impact on human animals, it impacts on non-human animals too, and the promotion of conservation. And as we've seen um, largely in the past, this promotion of conservation has been around this idea of consumptive use. We see things like trophy hunting. These are colonial legacies that really are not part of traditional African culture, like trophy hunting. These are things that we've seen come into our society through other means. And then we have this um, sustainable use and development. And again, this, this I'm gonna highlight the term sustainable use because this has been extremely controversial um, in the context of particularly wild animals and, and government has used this to justify a lot of abuses and repulsive practices that have been done to animals. And then the final um, aspect is while promoting uh, justifiable economic and social development. And I think that word justifiable is an important aspect here that we need to look at in the context of our use and abuses of animals. So these are some selected examples. As I mentioned, I think there's many that I could have chosen, but these are a couple that I selected to look at in the context of the environmental right, particularly. Um, so South Africa's NDC, which I'm gonna to touch on, the National Biodiversity Framework, the recent policy position on the ecologically sustainable use of elephant, lion, leopard, and rhino, and then some of the agricultural-based ones, by um, DALRRD, the live export guidelines, then there's also the freshwater capture. So you see all of these come up and manifest in different ways in our society, in our law, in our policy, in our use of animals. Um, selected problematic examples of wildlife um, animal practices. So industrialized animal agriculture happening on a mass scale and increasingly so in South Africa. Uh, commercial wild caught fishing, again, another big issue. Aquaculture is an increasing issue and it's actually the fastest growing food production system in the world. It's also being promoted by government. Uh, wildlife farming, trophy hunting, and live export. And I'll also just take this opportunity to say that many of these industries, particularly in South Africa, are not sufficiently or properly regulated. Uh, they rely a lot on self-regulation. Government hasn't promulgated proper standards, particularly for animal agriculture. So this is where we start to see like just administrative action rights and things come into play. 
So I, I highlighted just one of these, which is industrialized terrestrial animal agriculture. And I'm not gonna go through all of these harms, but you'll start to see the impact of these practices and, and on the environment and on our guaranteed constitutional human rights. These are, these are massive, these are well proven across the globe. We've seen these occur in countries who have been doing it for much longer than we have. Um, they are, they are um, slowly starting to recognize this and put laws in place. Unfortunately, South Africa is going in the opposite direction where we are trying to promote increased consumption, increased industrialized terrestrial animal agriculture, increased wild caught fishing, and you get the point. So I did want to highlight the NDC, and we actually, as Animal Law Reform, worked with um, ELA on this. Uh, what was overtly missing from the NDC, which is supposed to address our climate plan, essentially, uh, was the fact that they did not mention at all animal agriculture or the fishing sectors, right? So they talk about the focus on the electricity sector in the 2020s and the 2030s, the transport sector. And then the 2040s, they talk about the hard to mitigate sectors. So there's really this massive, massive gap in our, in our way to address climate change, particularly when you're looking at the percentage of greenhouse gas emissions. Why are we not talking about these industries? Why are we not including them as part of our strategies? Another example is South Africa's National Biodiversity Framework. So again, this is the legislative framework that is attempting to deal with some of our biodiversity loss. Um, so I'm not going to go into detail on the submissions. They're online, and I'm happy to send them to anyone who's interested. But again, we don't uh, include in these risks to and pressures on our biodiversity, uh, large-scale industrial animal agriculture, overfishing, things like that, which we know for a fact are putting pressure on our biodiversity. Why are we not including these, at least in our policies, and putting in place sufficient laws and procedures to mitigate against the harms that they cause? So uh, I have a couple minutes and, and really want to highlight here how things are slowly, I believe, changing in some respects. And um, this specifically focuses on conservation, right, the integrative and the aggregative approach. And I've got the citation there for those who want to read more about it. But really what it, what it is, it requires us to reconsider our relationship with nature, right, the aggregative approach really looks at things at a species level and it allows the sacrifice of an individual for almost like the greater good. So trophy hunting is okay, okay if some of those proceeds will go to species preservation, right? Um, so Professor Bolchitz actually argues that this is self-defeating in the larger sense. And really what we need to do is the aggregative approach where the individual animal is protected. So only when we consider the individual um, can we consider or look at the sustainability of the whole, right? We have to respect the individual animal and offer them protection in their own right. And this has been adopted by the Constitutional Court in the NSPCA case of 2016. And I've isolated the main three paragraphs. I won't get to go through all of them. But what's important is that the Constitutional Court has recognized that the integrative approach really links the suffering of individual animals to conservation. So we're not looking again at a species level. We're looking at the individual welfare of animals. And we are saying that this is important if we want to protect them and if we want to achieve the environmental right to environment. So this is no longer pie in the sky. The Constitutional Court has recognized that we have to consider animal interests. And I submit that this gives us a lot of opportunities, not just for wild animals, but to deal with some of the issues that I've highlighted in some of the practices and ways that we use animals, right? <clears throat> And then the court also referred to a number of other cases, including the Supreme Court of Appeal case in Lim Tong Tai, and then also uh, Judge Cameron's minority judgment in Openshaw, where he said that animals are sentient beings that are capable of suffering and experiencing pain. So again, I won't go into all of these, but we start to see how all of these statements from the court actually, uh, if, we, if we consider them in their totality, they create a lot of favorable jurisprudence for us to achieve better protection for animals. And constitutional values dictate a more caring attitude towards fellow humans, animals, and the environment in general. And if everything is required to be uh, interpreted through a constitutional lens, and that lens requires us to be more compassionate and caring towards animals, then that too must be refre reflected adequately in our law and policy and practices. And although that case was from 2016, we have seen it come to play in the High Court case from 2019, which related to the export uh, line bone quota in terms of CITES or the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species. And the court adopted that approach and they actually said that the failure by the department 
to consider the welfare of lions in making that determination essentially made it unconstitutional and unlawful. So that is now being uh, reflected in a different way. And I am uh, sorry. So it actually raises a number of important questions. Uh, that particular case and all of those cases combined, right? They haven't fully been realized, obviously, in our law and policy, but I believe they provide at least a framework for us to have an inclusive right to the environment. Animals must be treated uh, with intrinsic value as individuals, right? It does raise some other questions. What does this mean, for example, when we're looking at fishing rights and allocations? Does, does it come into play there or does it only come into play with the charismatic megafauna like lions, right? What about some of the other practices that we are doing? Is it only wild animals? So all of these questions are things that are yet to be determined, but I submit provide us with a lot of opportunity to get better protection. Uh, and one of the very, very recent policies, which I uh, largely was happy to see, although I, I believe there are still uh, some issues with it, does see a shift in this approach, right, towards this more integrative approach. So this relates to the high-level panel that was set up by the Minister of Environment to specifically relate to four species, which was lions, leopards, rhinos, and elephants. And the vision is largely like a transformational approach, right? We want to have an inclusive transformed and sustainable wildlife sector. So there was a recognition that our current practices relating to our wildlife were not those things, right? We, we cannot simply allow to farm uh, wildlife to can lion hunting and shoot them. So we need this transformational approach. And those were some of the species specific interventions that are listed. I won't go through all of them, but the main one that you might have seen was the halting of the domestication and exploitation of lions, right? That was international news. So that was a very positive one. There's still some problems I submit with allowing trophy hunting and things like that, but largely it's positive to see that there has been this shift. Um, this is currently now just been opened again yesterday for public comment, if any of you are interested. We submitted comments in, in the first batch um, and largely just say, you know, we have to consider the individual interests of animals. So I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna just quickly kind of conclude. I believe that we need to take this integrative approach a little bit further and go for this integrational approach, right? And what the integrational approach does is it means that justice is for all members of our earth community, right? Um, it recognizes that these systems and the way that we treat each other and we treat our earth and we treat non-human animals are based on systems of oppression, right? So we need to essentially dismantle those systems. We need to ensure accountability, this is government, governmental level, individual level, corporate level. We cannot look at human rights and animal interests and environmental interests as separate from one another. We cannot say all, we have to use this and an inclusive narrative, right? In fact, human rights are enriched by the consideration of the interests of animals. And really, if we're looking at being a progressive uh, democracy, we have to give justice and protection to all who require it in our society, right? Um, I believe this gives us a lot of opportunities for so for systematic change and for a lot of the problems that we've discussed in our panel so far, um, there are of course some specific issues and reforms that are really needed immediately. But I think that working together with environmental lawyers, social justice lawyers, and those who protect animals will really help us get there a lot quicker with our targeted and collaborative e efforts. And we do need to hold those who are exploiting and benefiting from these systems accountable. And the constitution, I believe, is the tool to do this. Great, I'm not uh, unaware of the fact that there are going to be a number of challenges. There are vested interests in this. There's practical challenges, there's conflicts of right, there's cultural implications, right? We have a history that needs to be considered. The floodgates arguments of, you know, where do we draw the line? What happens when we start considering animals? All of these things are part of um, the decision-making process and the practical considerations that we would need to do. But it doesn't mean that we should just exclude these interests ab initio. Right, so um, I think there's a lot of really good materials that are showing this interlink between the interests of non-human animals and the environment. Actually today that eating our way to extinction, the very top one is coming out. Um, I encourage you to, to watch some of these, there's criticisms around them, but I believe it is eye-opening for, for some just to the extent and the scale to which it's happening. So um, they're very good resources to start with. And with that, I'm going to end with a, a quote from the 2016 NSPCA case, which was made by Justice Kampepe, and he really talks about the, 
the shift with our relationship with animals, right? They're not mere brutes or beasts anymore, but they are actually fellow mortals, they're fellow creatures, and they are companions, friends, and brothers. And I think we need to look at them holistically as part of the inhabitants of our earth. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you all for your time. Thanks so much, Amy, for that encouragement to us all to transcend our silos. It definitely seems that the theme of this panel is turning out to be a, a challenge to dichotomies. Um, we had uh, Melanie challenging us around the false dichotomies between environmental justice and social justice, and you've uh, encouraged us to, to take that a step further to think about um, dichotomies between uh, the rights of, of humans and the rights of non-human animals. Um, and these are these are difficult questions, um, controversial ones, as, as, as you rightfully highlight, um, but important ones to interrogate. And so it's great to, to, to see some um, vigorous debate playing out in the chat, which will come come to you. So thanks so much to all of our panelists. We are going to, to open up now for some debate and discussion. I think we'll start with the comments and questions that have been posted so far in the chat and then open up to, to new contributions and inputs. Um, perhaps I can ask my co-chair Oliver if you want to just uh, kind of round up the, uh, the questions and comments from the chat. Thanks, Lisa, for the opportunity. I think that uh, we've had very interesting comments from Karen and, uh, and Melanie and uh, Vilemin. I think that instead of paraphrasing what they have said, I'll give them the opportunity to raise their, their concerns and then we can engage with it. Uh, Karen, uh, can you unmute and raise the concern that you raised in the chat room? Hey, can you guys hear me? Hey, can you hear me, Oliver? Yes, I can okay. hear you very well, Karin. Hi, <laughs> Oliver, it's been too long we've last talked. Oh, anyway. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, my concern is, you know, I think the last comment in the chat, or one of the last comments in the chat actually captured it uh, from, from um, Barry Wiesner, in that he said, is it really a rights issue? And the moment you start phrasing that you want to have non-human rights, you are entering extremely dangerous territory in the global south situation, where the right to an environment that's not harmful to human health and well-being is a fragile one, and it's a new one. And I'm often involved in, 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 in some political discussions where high-level politicians are saying things like, we don't need EIA regulations, it's hampering development. We don't need environmental protection, it's standing in the way of the, of the economic growth of this country. And we should be extremely careful when we phrase these issues as a rights issue. I'm all for, and I'm the first one to say, yes, let's protect biodiversity, because that is essentially part of the theory of redundancy. If you have 100 species, it is way more um, robust than if you have 20 species. If you have multiculture, it's way more preventative of what erosion and, and so on than if you have a monoculture like a forestation or, or cornfields. So I'm saying we should be very careful about how we phrase what we're saying. In, in all, I didn't disagree with the context of the presentation. I think it was a brilliant presentation, but I'm a, I'm a, I must raise the concern about how we phrase non-human rights as a rights issue. Because that creates a political problem in a country which is very much aimed at development and social upliftment. And the overemphasis on green issues can often harm communities. And it has. And we will show you in our presentation, myself and Dr. Faridan and Hermari, we will show you on uh, our discussion um, on, on, on Saturday, how this has caused harm to communities in Dalmas, because we overemphasize green issues. It is a very delicate balance. And yes, our politicians need education. And yes, we are in a, in a, 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 in a grips of, of greed capitalism sometimes, which forces these thoughts and ideas. And what is the other thing that call it new liberalism, liberalism. So yes, but one has to be very careful 
although we know this, we know capitalism harms communities too, we must be very careful on how we phrase these things. And this forum is a safe forum to raise it. But when we go outside and we talk to politicians, um, saying something like non-human rights will we'll say, well, you guys are like that farmer there in Limpopo and it's his dog ride in the front of the bucky and his workers on the back. And that's a very sensitive political issue in a country like South Africa. Yeah, th thanks very much for your concerns, uh, Karin. I think they are very valid. I could not stop but uh, laughing with the <laughs> examples that you've, that you've given. Uh, I think uh, if Niels was here, he would have been able to tell you that uh, he has previously argued in other presentations that uh, elephants should be cowed because of the destruction which uh, they cause even to our own, our own uh, 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 environment if they are left unchecked. Uh, Prof. Lemin, I think that is the point which you were making. You want to, you want to, you want to jump in. Well, thank you, Oliver. It was rather a comment, and it was also in light of the um, issue that we have. If you think uh, it, it's a great uh, that Amy indicate also the animal rights, and I think it's very important. But perhaps, and she listed the challenges. But I think one of the challenges also the protection of ecosystems. And we've seen that destruction of ecosystems led to the fact that viruses don't have a new vector and that vector then moves towards people and we have the coronaviruses, et cetera, as a result of that. Um, so definitely, so we need to protect all of our species and ensure um, that we don't destroy them. And it was more than a, a sort of an additional remark to what I may have said. Thanks, Wilhelmin. Uh, Melanie, you can take over. Thanks. I think we just need to be cautious in, in being reactionary and, and raising whataboutisms when uh, new approaches are proposed, because the current approach, the current politics, the current law is failing us. It's, it's failing our ecosystems and it's failing the poor. Um, so you know, when new approaches are proposed, it's easy to have a knee jerk and, and, and get defensive about it. But the, and it's also important to think of possible objections and to, to grapple with those objections. But, um, you know, at, at the same time, to look at the arguments for alternatives on its own terms and to try and implement it because what we need is radical reform. We, we can't anymore when we're approaching global uh, destruction that will, will impact the poor most, just carry on as normal because politicians might get upset. <laughs> um, to me, that's, you know, that, that's, uh, of course we have to engage with their objections and perceptions, but that's kind of the least of my worries. Thank you, Amy. Amy, you have the right to respond. Hey, thank you. Um, I yeah, I definitely appreciate all of your concerns. Um, you know, I, I think they're extremely valid. It's something I've thought about a lot in my work doing animal law over the last couple of years. Um, one thing I will say is that rights are um, a legal fiction, right? It's something that humans have created. So corporations have rights. Um, they have rights because they live and operate within our legal system. Increasingly around the world, uh, nature is being granted rights, as we've seen. It doesn't mean that people have suddenly stopped cutting down trees just because nature has rights in Bolivia or Colombia or things like that. The existence of rights itself, even the existence of a right, a human, human environmental right, doesn't mean that people have um, clean drinking water and um, have clean air. So the existence of a right needs to be separated out from the enforcement of that right. The pure granting of rights doesn't mean that all of a sudden people are not going to be able to do the things that they are. What they do create is at least a platform or uh, they're a holder or a space for that entity to have a voice, right? So it gives them some sort of legal right or entitlement to do something or to have somebody speak on their behalf. So essentially it makes them a stakeholder in the discussion. And I think by not having 
the vast majority of the population of Earth even having a, a stake in the discussion has led us to this crisis. And as Melanie rightfully pointed out, the current system has failed us. We've had animal welfare and animal protection laws for years. We've had biodiversity laws for years, for decades. Where are we now? We're in an environmental crisis. Clearly it's not working. It's not good enough for us to simply have laws or to say animal welfare. Yes, we need to have a radical approach, not to say that that's gonna be unlimited, but it needs to at least be thought about and spoken about. So um, I think that's how I would respond. I think it's a very complicated issue, but I think uh, a legal right is a fiction. And in order to exist in the society, you at least need a stake in the conversation. Thanks, uh, thanks Amy. I see uh, our chair, Peter, has a question for you. Peter, do you want to post it directly? Yes, okay, thank you, Oliver. Sorry about the delay, getting to my screen. Um, it's quite simply, um, can we not secure the bridge first? A bridge to an eventual ecocentric right. Um, what I say there is that we do have standing to act for all non-human animals and animals. And you know, perhaps that's the next step to secure it first, that's all. But thanks for your presentation. Yeah, thank you. I think bridges are great. I think we need a lot more bridges in a lot more places, um, uh, virtual bridges, of course. Um, I think uh, if, everywhere we've seen is incremental change, right? We, it's definitely not going to happen overnight. And maybe, yes, um, environmental rights is the bridge. And that's why I think interpreting the human right to environment in South Africa is essentially a bridge for us to get better protection for animals. So uh, I love that point and I think absolutely. And I'd love to see more environmental lawyers uh, using it as a bridge for protection for non-human animals too. Thanks very much, Thanks. Thanks, Amy. Oliver, I wanted to suggest uh, in, the, in the interests of, of equity that we make sure we, uh, we capture the comments and questions that were directed at some of the other speakers as well. Yes, that, that, that is uh, what I was about to do. Uh, I, I don't really see questions here that are directed to the other speakers per se. Um, I want to open it up to the uh, audience, to the att uh, attendees, to be able to ask questions to the other presenters. Oliver, perhaps as a, as a place to start, I think there were one or two questions uh, directed at, at Pasquale particularly in the chat, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I, I had the question. I saw more of a compliment from Melanie. Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll try and go through. Yeah, Melanie, you can take over while I try to go through the, the chat. Sure. The, the question is around the, the authors like Lazarus who ad adopt the bad lens to environmental rights. And I was wondering, what do they say we should have instead? And, and the same kind of applies to, to Barry's question or comment is, you know, if we don't have, have rights as important tools to achieve outcomes um, and that we can enforce, what, what do we want in the place of that? Um, so someone who adopts that bad lens, what do they have to say? Um, and then one possible and plausible approach that I've seen in the literature is Burden's idea of increased obligations towards the environment. Um, and there's an interesting work on that in 2020, Law and Critique, and I wondered if you'd thought of that, about that at all, Pasquale. Thank you very much. I will try to, re, to be really, really uh, brief uh, ab about the, the Badlands. So they, they just suggest that environmental law should develop or has to develop within the, the theoretical framework provided by uh, the social values constitutional narratives. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, basically, this is the, the approach that they suggest. And there isn't a proper space for environmental constitutionalism, but there is a space for environmental law when environmental law is considered just as administrative law, not other kinds of, of, of uh, legal branches to cope with environmental degradation and so on. And then about the second point, about the obligation. So uh, as first I would just recall the Emmy's point on the changing of narrative. 
uh, related to the or and versus, uh, and we should go towards the end, uh, at least in reference to uh, humans and non-humans animals. And the same is um, the same discourse is played also uh, between human and the nature as well, because uh, like uh, humankind uh, fought against uh, nature just to become as. Uh, Gordon also highlight become the, the, the major driving force to shape our environment and our planet. And this is the Anthropocene, of course. Uh, but since uh, so in this afternoon session, so uh, I uh, couldn't hear the word duty. But uh, we usually think starting from a right-based approach and a right-based approach, uh, while we should think that uh, uh, you said, Melanie, you were talking about uh, uh, to be careful with new concepts. But the, but the point is that we should take old concepts as new, like the concept of beauty. And uh, in the Western legal tradition, uh, we hardly start to think moving from duties, like it happens in, in other uh, geographic area in, in the world. And we used to refer always to right-based approach. And this is what also Bourdon highlights, that we should think about our obligations towards the environment and towards the ecosystem and towards other animals that are not like us. So that's the point, yes. And, and I, I'm trying, uh, me and, and a few colleagues of mine, we are trying to fight this sort of, sort of crusade against the right-based approach. <laughs> but I think we are losing it. So <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. Are you taking over, Lisa? I I I I I don't see a lot of questions in the in the chat uh, uh, room. I mostly see comments. Good. Th thanks, Oliver. This is this is very much a, a multi-part harmony, this session. Um, so I think we have uh, probably covered all the direct questions. Um, so to just kind of throw it out, we've probably got another five minutes or so. Does anyone who mm -hmm. hasn't commented or asked a question yet uh, want to contribute something? You're welcome to, to raise your hand or to unmute or to type in the chat. Susanna's hand is up. Susanna, you can unmute and, and speak. Thank you, Oliver. I just wanted to give my two cents worth on the PHA uh, case that Melanie referred to in her presentation. And um, I, I've been part of the team that put together that case. It took us uh, three years to get to court and another three years to file and another two years to get to court. And the points that uh, Melanie made are, are so relevant in that our lead advocate was very procedural and technical and wasn't interested in being creative at all. Um, he's the, do you want to be a politician or do you want to win the case? You know, and um, that that ruling that you referred to, Melanie, it, basically we didn't we didn't win outright. They sent it back to appeal level. So both the rezone and the EIA. Um, have gone back to appeal level, so there's now room for creativity. So I wanted to say thank you so much, um, Melanie, for, for your input. And um, I'm looking forward to perhaps working a little bit with you on the resubmission of our EIA paperwork and the, um, and the rezone appeal paperwork so that we can bring this, um, this link between social justice and environmental uh, justice together, because Ironically, so far on the PHA campaign case, it's the environmental rights that are winning the social justice rights for us. So this fascinating um, supplement between the two different um, arenas of law, like Tim Becker mentioned last night, um, it, it's it's very useful. Um, we we will be resubmitting our EIA comments. Um, in that um, you mentioned that they, they have to examine the impact on the aquifer and water scarcity and climate change. And then I'm sure that we will end up in court again. So the trick would be to be creative and submit the paperwork in such a way that we can advance these 
your 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 way of thinking. So thank you for the inspiration. I'm going to rush off and do some paperwork now. <laughs> thank you. It's exciting. I think it's the, the reason why we have these conferences is to bring different ideas and perspectives together. So it's, it's an honor to have any kind of influence. Thanks, Susanna. I think, Peter, would you like to make an input? Yes, thank you. Um, to James May, to thank you for your presentation. It seems like a long time ago already. Um, and for sharing your article, because I think I think that is really seminal. Um, the cross pollination of the various human rights um, really adds a lot of texture, and we've seen this in EIA, Environment Impact Assessment, where a, a particular project can impact on so many aspects of the various human rights. And as the saying goes, the law is a seamless web. You touch one but you touch them all and it's sometimes just a matter of emphasis as to where you're going to land for the strength of a case um, so um, although we've now been talking about animal rights um, locating the debate in a human rights uh, paradigm uh, is a familiar territory really i think for the courts um, it's part of that bridge perhaps i was talking about uh, so uh, I just really wanted to thank you uh, for that. And of course, I think it totally fits in with Melanie, with your transformative environmental constitutional, constitutionalism as well. Because without the environment, the, the other rights uh, don't really have a founding at all. So that's lovely uh, to work with. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I don't see any other hands or comments. Um, so unless there's any remaining burning questions, I'll just, perhaps let's just give our panelists um, a, a moment or two each just to make some concluding remarks. Why don't we go in, in order of presentation? So Melanie, kick off. Uh, yeah, I, I don't have anything to add. Uh, I. I'm hoping that the, the theory can start to be implemented. <laughs> and so I'd be really excited to work with uh, Susanna and anyone else who's interested in trying to put these ideas in practice and test them, because obviously as academics, we spend a lot of time theorizing and we only know if these ideas can make a difference when, when they get used by the people who are, are working on the ground. But thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Melanie. Pascale? Yes, so I would like just to thank the Environmental Association of South Africa and Melanie Marco for such inspiring opportunity. Really, many, many thanks. And, and of course, Lisa and, and the co chair for treating this. Thanks, Amy. Over to you. Great. I'd just also like to echo my thanks. I think it's wonderful to have the opportunity to discuss these things. I think there's um, obviously a, a, it's a very kind of complicated issue. There's no easy answers, particularly the stuff that I've been talking about with non-human animals. It raises a lot of um, personal and professional um, kind of biases and, and it forces us to grapple with these things. So um, I just thank you for your time and listening and, and being open to hear it. And I would uh, love to hear from anyone uh, after this, if you have an interest in the work that we do and otherwise just thank you for the work that you do. Great, well, I will hand over to Oliver for the last word. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by thanking our presenters for very thought-provoking and uh, very insightful and also very exciting papers that were delivered. I thoroughly enjoyed the presentations and uh, I hope that you also enjoyed. And, uh, I want to wish them good luck, especially for those that uh, are writing up their papers with the, intentions of, uh, with the intention of having them uh, submitted for peer review and hopefully uh, publication. And, uh, I also want to take the opportunity to thank uh, those of you who were able to uh, uh, join us uh, during this session. At one time, I realized there were about uh, 54 of us online, 
I want to thank you for the time that you 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 took uh, to come join us and for the interest you've you've shown in the activities of the Environmental Law Association. We really appreciate your support, and uh, I want to thank the chair for taking the the lead on uh, coordinating the presentations. And uh, I want to say that uh, you should enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, I hope that uh, next year we'll have the opportunity to interact live. Face-to-face, uh, -face, not uh, online, and uh, that will give us the opportunity to be able to have a peer. Uh, I hear uh, uh, Karin indicating the, the, the other time or a few minutes ago that it has been a while since we, since we met. That is true. We think that uh, things will definitely change next year with the rate of the vaccine rollout, and uh, I look forward to seeing most of you next year. Thanks very much, uh, Melanie, for the lead that you've, you've taken in terms of uh, the organization, it is much appreciated. Uh, I think uh, that said, I want to wish all of you a pleasant evening further.